results of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're coming to you live from many places around the country this morning. So thrilled to be here with you on this Monday morning. Uh, everybody's talking about the phantom week that all of us were thinking we had two weeks before Thanksgiving, but there it's there's a phantom week that does not exist. So uh, next week is Thanksgiving here in the United States and I don't know how we got there. I don't know, I don't know how that happened. I can't quite figure it out because I'm still on like March 24th. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, like I have to go back and, and go, okay, well this happened in March and this happened in April. These months have passed, Shannon. Uh, but it is a little like Groundhog Day and it does all sort of meld in together, but it isn't. We're, it's November. We, we, gotta, we gotta snap too. We gotta be with it here. We gotta be making progress, right? So Thanksgiving is next week. We are gonna have some interesting things going on this week. Good morning, Amanda. Happy birthday. Happy belated birthday. Um, so we are going to have some things going on this week because Thanksgiving is next week. And then we have a different schedule next week because it's Thanksgiving. Don't worry. We got you. We'll, we'll be on all the time and you'll have an opportunity. Hi, Joel. Uh, we'll, you'll have an opportunity to see some of your favorite things because we've got a, a Thanksgiving marathon that we're going to be running that's some of our favorite moments from 2020. <laughs> a year that will live in infamy literally infamy, right? Uh, good morning, Christina. So glad that you are here with us. So uh, I'm so excited to be here with you guys this morning. I, I, I miss you guys when I love having a weekend. Don't get me wrong, but I miss you guys. I miss being here with you. So we are going to be with you live for the next hour talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. We want for you to come wherever you are and whoever you are. This show, I always say our mission is to provide information and inspiration. And we talk about this show being for the larger autism community. So that starts with individuals who are on the autism spectrum. I always think of them as the beating core, the heart of our community, right? Of course. Uh, and we want to help provide that community with information and inspiration, but we also include in our community everyone who loves those individuals. So that's an even bigger group of people. We know that together we are diverse and that we all have different opinions and thoughts and concerns and needs. It's not a one-size-fits-all community, but there are a couple of things that we all have in common, and that is the continuing quest to make sure that individuals on the autism spectrum get their rights that they get uh, opportunity, that they have housing, jobs, uh, a, a way to love who they love, right? So uh, that's who this show is for, that entire community. And of course, that includes people like teachers and grandparents and aunts and uncles and boyfriends, girlfriends, wives, pastors, right? Everybody that loves an individual on the spectrum and those on the spectrum. That's what we're here for, to promote the best possible living situations for all of those people. So um, I hope that you'll join us. There's lots of different ways to participate. Traven's probably going to show you here in a second, a slide. We have more and more ways that we're coming to you in this, this COVID madness, the great isolation, as we're calling it, right? Um, Traven's been working hard to find more and more ways so that you can get the information that you need. We are live right now on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Periscope, as well as our homepage, autism-live.com. I know that's been broken for a little while uh, in terms of the live feature, but I think, I hope, I think it might be playing there live this morning. Uh, if not, we're, we're still working on it. But I, I also want to let you know that there is... Um, 
the opportunity to watch us live, but there's also the opportunity to watch us in podcast form. So iTunes, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Ghana, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Audible, and Deezer. So all of those places, we are a free download. We hope that you will listen or watch or listen and watch. And on several of those, you, including iTunes, you have the choice. Do you want to just listen or do you want to be able to see and listen? Hey, May, good morning. How are you? So uh, we're thrilled to be able to be on all those platforms. I will tell you, if you're watching live, that first column, just um, put your comment in the the platform that you're watching. If you're watching on YouTube, you put your question on YouTube and it shows up right here for me almost in real time. Um, if you are watching in any of the places where we're podcast, then I really want to encourage you to check out our live feature on autism-live.com. There's a chat feature there and you can go in and leave a comment at any time. So, you know, you're listening on iTunes and and you're like, this is fabulous. I'd like to interact with the show. Just head over to autism-live.com. There's a chat. You can do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Obviously, someone isn't there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But uh, I check that on a regular basis. And we include those questions, for instance, when we do like um, our special live shows with Temple Grandin or when we are live with, say, Dr. Grampiche or another expert. So feel free to write your question in there. And I know that is working. That that had had a problem, but it's working once again. We have gremlins. I don't like the gremlins, right? But we, we want to be able to be here in whatever way you need us. So if there's something we're missing, if you're like, well, gee, Shannon, I just wish you were on this website. Like, what is wrong with you that you're not there? Just assume that I'm ignorant uh, <laughs> and get an email off to me so that I know where you'd like to see us. I know somebody had written it about Soundgarden and we're looking into that. But uh, so thrilled that all of you are here with us. I love that Christine is worried about me. She says that my eyes are red. Ever since COVID came, um, so I'm gonna like give you guys the lowdown on Ever since COVID came, I don't know, I've had like some allergic reaction to my eye makeup and I have allergies anyway, right? So I stopped wearing eye makeup. Yes, it's true. And I started wearing my fake glasses. There's there's no lens in here. <laughs> so, so I get away with wearing less. Uh, yes, that is the truth, y'all. I do wear glasses that, you know, so I can see, but there's too much glare. So we pop the lenses out of them, but it means that I wear less eye makeup because I have terrible, terrible allergies. And I think they've just made wor been made worse by COVID because we have all these trees where I live. And used to be I was out of the office, out in the office, and I wasn't here. And we inherited a dog in all of this too because the lovely Joanne Laura passed away, and so her. And so I'm I'm sure my body is struggling to keep up, but I'm alive and well. Thank you, Christine. I'm uh, Christina. I'm not. Uh, I'm okay. But this is the the general thing. Uh, hey, May, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here with us. I'm glad that I'm here and I'm glad we're here together. So that's really wonderful. Okay, you guys, uh, on Mondays, we like to start the show, first of all, with me reminding all of you that we have lots of experts that come on the show. I'm not one of them. Clearly, I'm the idiot wearing the, the no glasses, uh, <laughs> no lens glasses. And listen, I have different colors of them too. So there's a, sh a slight shade of pink to this one. There are others as well. Uh, now you know all the secrets. Aren't you glad? Uh, I don't like to hide anything. But uh, we have experts on lots of things that aren't eyeglass related, right? And we're thrilled to be able to bring them here. You know, I always like to remind you, I'm not one of the experts. I'm a, a really proud mom of an individual who was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. I'm a former teacher and I'm a former stand-up comedian. These are the credentials that you need <laughs> to sit where I'm sitting. But here's the biggest credential. I care deeply about all of you and the journey that you're on. And I want to help you to find a way to remember the joy and the humor and find the access to the things that are gonna help you to get there faster. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you're part of that autism community, I, I do, I have, a, I have a passion and I feel a responsibility because I've been very lucky. Um, you know, I did, I belong to that kitchen floor club that they call when you know you're on your, your knees on the floor and you're praying to the God of your understanding. And I remember I said, please help me to help this child. Please don't let it be my story that I mess this up 
because I didn't know what to do. Please show me what to do. And I promise if you help me to help my child that I will, I will do whatever, you know, is required of me. And I will promise to turn around and help whoever I can. So that's the deal. That's why I'm here. I want to help you to get what you need to get to. That's what, but I'm not an expert. I have an opinion. <laughs> I always have an opinion. And I've been hosting shows about autism for over a decade and interviewing experts. So, you know, I like to say it's an informed opinion. What do I know? Because I'm not an expert. So um, just remember me, not the expert, but I'll give you my opinion anytime you want it. But I uh, have lots of other experts that are here for you. Okay, so we like to start off by reminding you of that. Next, we like to do something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to give you, first of all, the actual definition, and then I make fun of it whenever possible. Uh, because there's so much to be made fun of, and life is short. And then we give you a working definition, which sometimes still needs to be made fun of. But I try to give you an example, it, it, even if it's your first day coming into autism, that helps you to begin to understand. Nobody expects you to be a Rhodes Scholar on this stuff, uh, you know, in your first eight years, right? Uh, ever, really, unless you go to school and get the degree. But I want to be able to help you to understand, oh, why is this important to me right now? How does this help me right now? How does this save me five minutes, five dollars? Um, how does this get us closer to where we want to be? And so I'll try to give that to you in complete jargon-free terms. But if I ever mess up, hey, Alicia, so thrilled you're here. If I ever mess up and I start, I go to the dark side and start using jargon, just, you know, give me a Yelp and say, hey, I don't know what that means. May says, love the jargon has helped me so much in my undergraduate program that I'm in for behavior analysis. An uh, am analyst. I just love that. That is so funny to me because, you know, we started this so that we could understand behavior and uh, analysts. And now they're, they're using our jargon to train behavior analysts. I don't know. It's like the universe folded over on itself. It's uh, some sort of weird thing. Hey, Helen, how are you? So glad that you're here. Uh, but I love, I, I love doing the jargon. It helps me to stay up on these terms. So today is an oldie, but a goodie. And, um, it's something that we talk a lot about on this show, but I'm going to put a little asterisk after it before we're done. I'm talking about ABA. Welcome to alphabet land. I literally have a song and shoe about that, but we're not that we're going to save that for another day. Uh, so alphabet land, A, B, A, what's it stand for? Let's take a look at our actual definition. There's probably not much to be made fun of there, but let's see. ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis. ABA is the application of the principles of learning and motivation from behavior analysis. Don't you love it when they just rearranged the, the chairs on the Titanic and be like, now you should know. ABA is Applied Behavior Analysis. And so it's behavior analysis and you apply it right? Now you're done. Uh, it employs procedures and technology derived from scientifically demonstrated principles of behavior. Thank you for using the same words. To increase socially significant behaviors and decrease unwanted or inappropriate behaviors. Ladies and gentlemen, is it any wonder that there are many people who look at ABA and they go, I don't think that sounds right. I don't think that I'm interested in that. I don't think I want that or need that in my life, right? When I hear people talking about inappropriate behaviors, I'm like, inappropriate to who? Oh, you want us to do socially significant? Oh, it sounds like you want me to be like you. Mm, I'm not interested, right? Uh, I should move to Austin because I like the whole thing about keep it weird, right? Odd is good. Different is where it's at. So this does not appeal to me even a little bit, right? And it's scientifically demonstrated principles of behavior doing what? Sounds boring, right? Okay, but hold the phone because this is not the whole story. Let's move on to our working definition to see what ABA might mean. It's a proven method of increasing or teaching desired behavior and reducing unwanted behavior. Okay, well, as a teacher, you're getting closer to piquing my interest here because I love to learn things and I love to teach things. And if there's a better way to do it, 
well, I want to know about that. Like if there's a certain amount of stuff in life that we need to teach people and there's a certain amount of stuff in life that we need to learn if we want to be able to do the things that we want to do. Now, everybody has different sets of things that they want to learn, although there's lots of crossover, right? I think we all understand and appreciate that we all have the right to communicate. That's not going to look the same for everybody. And I don't want to hear, you know, socially acceptable. Nah. We all have the right to communicate. And for some people, that means yelling. I don't like that. I really don't like it when people yell to communicate their needs. And I would rather give them an opportunity to communicate their needs without yelling. Okay. I don't know that that's you know, because society, that's my personal feeling. I guess society does feel that way too, but everybody has a right to communicate. And for some people that means signing for other people, that means clicking a button on an iPad. Um, for some people, it means speech and different levels of speech, right? So we want to be able to teach communication to people and we want to be able to have them communicate to us which way works most effectively for them. So we got to teach them enough communication so that they can communicate and that teach ourselves how to understand what they're saying. So when, I, when I'm talking about desired behavior, that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at, like things in that class. How does it help the person, right? Everybody's got something to learn on this planet. And then unwanted behavior, we all all of us engage in behaviors that aren't helpful to us. You know, ask yourself, what am I doing right now in my life that is not helpful to me and my goals? We all have something that's there. And I know from being a former classroom teacher that students come into the classroom and if they don't know how to do something, it doesn't feel good. You know, the kid who that I, I had a, um, a wonderful student in my seventh grade English class who was a brilliant artist, I came to find out, but he couldn't read. And so every time we would take out a book to read in class and I would have them read aloud because I think reading aloud is a great way to do learn a whole lot of things. But if you don't know how to read, like, you know, that's stress city. And he was living in fear that I was going to call on him to have him read. So he would turn his desk over. He would spit at me. He would throw things at other students so that he could get out of my classroom. And um, this is before I had a child on the autism spectrum, but I'd had some really good training as a, a, a teacher. And, and had a background that, that helped me to realize it was about more than the behavior was communication. And I just needed to get to the bottom of what it was that he was communicating. So I just want to be clear when we're talking about reducing unwanted behavior, it's behavior that's stopping the individual from being able, I mean, ultimately this young man was able to say to me, I'd like to be able to read. I just feel like it's too late. He was in seventh grade. And I was like, no, 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 no. It is not too late for you to learn how to read. It is not too late. Um, but it didn't need to be embarrassing for him in front of the whole class. You know what I'm saying? So as a teacher, now I like ABA. It's a proven method of teaching. And that when we teach people skills, then they don't need to use the rudimentary ones that are getting in their way that they thought were working, but really weren't. It was working for him. Upending the desk got him out of being embarrassed. It just didn't help him to be able to read, right? So ABA is considered the most effective teaching method that there is on the planet. And I know this firsthand because my son had, here's the asterisk that I was talking about, good quality ABA. I will tell you that, you know, you walk into a second grade classroom and all teachers are not the same. You know this, I know this, right? And, you know, you go into one second grade classroom and there's somebody who's doing it by the book, no passion. They're teaching, they're going to get some stuff done, but they're not really igniting students' hearts and minds, right? Um, and they don't really know what they're doing when a problem comes up, right? I liken this to poor ABA. Um, and, and poor ABA can create more problems than it solves. Good quality ABA. I called it the autism miracle in my living room. That's what I call good quality ABA, the autism miracle 
in my living room because there was a, a day and a time when I didn't know if my son could learn. And ABA taught me that my, the sky was the limit, that my kid could learn all kinds of things. So, and that he could learn them while being happy and being respected and being his whole being and not some cookie cutter on a treadmill, um, you know? So um, good quality ABA is where it's at. It is where it's at. And I love me some good quality ABA. I really hate, loathe, and despise poor schlocky ABA. We'll talk more about that. But ABA is considered the gold standard of treatment for autism. It is not the only autism intervention. And in fact, now in this wonderful new era, um, it is widely accepted to do ABA in conjunction with other things um, with your child. But ABA, when... When families are starting out and they say to me, what should I do? My child was just diagnosed with autism. The very first thing I say to them is get on a waiting list for a good quality ABA company. Boom. You know, that might take you a day or two to get on the waiting list and it might take some paperwork. Let's bang it out. Let's get on the waiting list. Let's get that done. Cause now you're going to have to wait. And then in the waiting period, I recommend a whole bunch of things, including cleaning up the child's diet, right? And getting ducks in a row because life is going to change. When you're doing intensive ABA at the right prescription, your life is going to change for a number of years. It's kind of like having an Olympic athlete in the house where everybody changes their priorities. They shift a little bit and go, we're going to do something amazing here as a family. We're going to change what's happening. Um, not just for this individual, but for the family and things do change. It's not easy, but it's everything. It's everything. I can, I can tell you it's absolutely everything. And one of the things that I'm still fighting for is for more and more of you to get, I love that we got insurance. Please don't get me wrong. I love, love, love that we got insurance so that more of you have access to ABA, but a lot of you are being sold a bill of goods either with a schlocky ABA or you're being told to do way too many hours, hours that are not scientifically proven to be effective. You really got to do this intensely. So uh, I get emotional, um, but um, good quality ABA is the reason why my son can do all the things that he can do in his life. And we are knee deep in college applications, y'all. It's just like crazy, crazy, crazy good. Uh, and when he was three, I didn't think that was possible. Every day I get to do things in my day that people told me were not possible and really good quality ABA made them possible. So this is not, you know, I love to make fun and kid and whatever, but this is serious business. So anyway, Good quality ABA, it's where it's all at. Okay, moving on. We always have a question of the day. I'll try to mop down. See, Christina, now my eyes are really red. Uh, <laughs> moving on. Uh, we have a question of the day for you. Our question is, what are you grateful for? Can you guess what I'm grateful for? I'm grateful for really good quality ABA, and I'm grateful that back in the day, the state of California paid for it for my son. Yeah, we had to fight, and we fought tooth and nail um, but we still got it and it made all the difference. I'm grateful for our health today. There are so many people who are not healthy today, more and more of our friends that are not healthy, but we're healthy. I'm grateful for all of you and I'm grateful for you guys being here. Um, oh, somebody says, uh, glad to see you. Can you suggest the best book for ABA so that parents can provide ABA at home? Um, if you want to do ABA at home, I don't want to recommend a book to you. I want to recommend two websites, but there is a book that's complementary to them. Um, we talk all the time on the show about skills, skillsforautism.com. And skills is a website that it's a, it's a, uh, but it's a bunch of tools. Think of it as a tool chest. And um, one of the many tools that is in there is an assessment to see where the individual is at. And by the way, there's two different skills. There's one for people who are under the age of 12, and there's one for um, individuals that are 14 and up. And so, you know, I know that you're like, ah, I have a 13 year old, uh, probably depending on where they were, they would probably start them in skills living. Um, but it's the curriculum, it's an assessment tool. It helps you with a whole lot of different things, but you need to know how to do it and to know how to do it. You want to go to iBehavioralTraining.com, and, um, 
tell them that Shannon sent you, get a discount. They have a lot of free things during COVID um, for lots of people, for educators and for parents, but ibehavioraltraining.com, check them out. Thank you, Traven, for putting that up there. And then our toy guide is coming out, we hope at the beginning of next week. And in the toy guide for caregivers, uh, under educational gift, I put this year, I don't have it with me, but it is the book version of what is in skills. It, it, you know, it's a, it's a tome. It's a big thing. Uh, you could use it for a doorstop. Don't, but, um, if you need, like me, sometimes I need to be able to, you know, read and page turn and dog ear stuff. Um, there is the book version, which is evidence-based treatment for autism, the CARD method. CARD is the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. And that is where my son got his therapy. And that curriculum that's the CARD method is what's in skills. So um, thank you for asking about that because I'm grateful for all of those things and I'm grateful for your question. Okay, moving on. We, because I think Bonnie is probably with us. Uh, we have a topic for the week and our topic is living in gratitude because it's important to be grateful, but we have to be living in the gratitude, you know? And I love November. November is an opportunity in a lot of different ways for me to remember to be grateful. Uh, obviously we have Thanksgiving and that's a wonderful thing, but um, it's also, you know how on Facebook you can see that there are pockets of months where there must be something to that whole astrology thing because you can see that like everybody you know has a birthday. Well, November is birthday central for me. Like, like so many people have that are important to me have birthdays in November. It's a really, really um, interesting thing. So I'm so grateful for so many of the people that I have in my life. Christina says, I'm grateful for friends that are about my son and myself to help us, uh, help support us. Um, Joel, uh, I don't know what that means, Joel. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure what that means, Joel. I need, you said, see, uh, something sees a sound. We're on for a date with scholarly. Uh, and then you said, uh, it was, uh, declarative, but you're subjectively welcome, Shannon. Okay. I, I thank you, but I don't, I'm not sure I understand it. You're smarter than I am. You have to explain it to me. In any case, I don't know. Traven is Bonnie with us. Our guest today is Bonnie Yates, and she's a special education attorney, but I don't know if she's already with us. If she is, let's get her fired up. It sounds like she's with us. Bonnie. She's here. She's Hi. here. She's I'm sorry, because I, sometimes I just go on and on and on and forget that you might be there waiting. Uh, so Bonnie is a special education attorney. She is an amazing person, and she just had a birthday this weekend, too. So we're oh saying- Oh my God, you are so on it. Well, Bonnie, I, I don't know this, but you share a birthday with my mother. And so oh, you were posting about your mom. But that's a very, you know, I believe in the whole birthday thing. Um, because I see I can see it clearly on Facebook. And so um, you know, I never forget your birthday because it's the same as my mom's. And I'm so grateful to know you and to have you in my life because you have been such, I'm so grateful for you, Bonnie. You've been such a, a touchstone and somebody who has helped me in so many different ways on this journey. So deeply, deeply appreciative to you and happy birthday and happy one more year around the sun. Yeah, and I'm, thank and you. I'm glad that this year around the sun has uh, had while it's been difficult in a lot of different ways, I think you've had some opportunity to be with a very special soul on this planet who uh, makes you extra happy. Of course, I'm talking about a grandchild. You you are absolutely right about all of that. Um, I'm from Tolner Law Offices. We're an aid attorney law firm. We're based in San Jose. If you um, have a special ed issue, you should probably talk to an attorney about your problem. The advice we give on the show is general only. If you're in California, Arizona, or Nevada, you can go to our website and you can fill in the form and we will set you up with a consultation. But, you know, your question about, about what are you grateful for? 
I'm still kind of like thinking that through because I think if you had said to me when I was in like year one or two of autism triage, mm -hmm. you should be grateful. I think I might have like cold talked you. Like, how could I be grateful? But of course, from the perspective I have now, my child got treatment within a, you know, a month of diagnosis, which is amazing now to, to, to consider that. I was fortuitously steered to CARD, you know, which um, could have not happened. And, um, and, you know, my son got a shot at it. And, um, and I, I will just say that the experience of grandparenting, a typically developing child has been so deep for me. Mm -hmm. I've been so affected by this 25 years of sitting with people and, 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 and being with them in their fear and their sadness about parenting a disabled child. And I, you know, I, I guess I'm just gonna be real today. For me on the best of days, it was very challenging. It was very, very hard for me. And, and I, I, I carry that with me, you know, today. So what you're all doing is really hard. And if you can find some gratitude in there, it'll just make you feel better. But if you can't, you know, it'll probably come later. It did for yeah. me. So. Um, I wanted to say that about your topic. And thank you. And I think that that's an important reminder. You know, we've talked a little bit over the years about how it appears that there are different phases on this journey for the caregivers. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm right there with you in the first two years. I think if somebody had said to me, you know, you're, there's going to come a time when you're going to be grateful for this journey that you're on, I seriously would have knocked them down. I like you saying cold cocked, um, but you know, I have to admit that um, I now with the perspective that I have, um, it's vastly different. It's vastly, vastly different. But I think that's, I think that's life in general when you, when you're able to look and, and not be in the fear anymore. Um, you know, I, when, when we first started to air, uh, there was a show that we were airing for a while that was called the A Word that followed a little boy on his trajectory through his ABA intervention. And it, it just, I loved watching it because I'd already read the book and, and, and seen the ending so I could appreciate what was mm -hmm. happening. And mm -hmm. while, while they were doing it with my son, I was too in the fear and the worry and the grief and the guilt about like, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. um, but being able to watch and know the end of the story, it was just a vastly, vastly different thing. Um, but I felt for the, the mom and the dad of this little boy as he was going through it. And I frequently would call them and go, hey, saw this, you're doing a great job, it's gonna be okay, and, and it is okay. So for everybody who's out there, uh, you know, having a hard time, um, look at Bonnie, Bonnie's amazing. Um, well, Shannon, we have a really good question and I think it's it's on our topic, but I wanna say first, I was listening to what you said about good ABA. Yeah. Um, and I guess, you know, that's um, when we get to the question, it is really important to explain to people what that, you know, what that looks like. And I remember there was another, there was a, was a mom who had a, her child go all the way through the card program. And when her daughter got sufficiently better, she threw a party mm. and she had an exhibit or a table or something. And on that table, she had like all the metrics. Uh, so she had something that showed how many drills the, the, the young lady had done in the course of her whole treatment and how many hours she had spent to get to this point. And so when we talk about good ABA, it's gotta be both good quality and it's gotta be intensity. And I would just say, I'm talking to a lot of parents that have ABA from a provider that's just doing what insurance tells them to do. They're getting nine hours a week, their kid is three, and nobody's ever sat down and talked to them about the fact that ABA has to be intensive to work because it's essentially a brain training program and you're doing reps, you're doing brain reps, and you can't get those brain muscles in shape if you're only gonna do a few reps every day. 
Yeah, so, amen to that, Bonnie. Uh, I that message. Uh, the insurance companies have done a really good job of making that so messed up that it's very hard to get through to parents. That it's about intensity, um, and you know, uh, I think we all thought in the beginning that it was crazy. I remember the first time somebody told me that my two and a half year old son should be getting 40, 40 hours a week of mm -hmm. therapy. And I, I was like, well, that's just crazy. That is just crazy. Partially because it is crazy. And partially because I knew for sure that I couldn't afford it. Well, exactly. We confronted something before 2012. I'll talk about it when we answer the question, but, but, you know, it was the same as being somebody that needs a medicine and you can't afford it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the grief and the helplessness that, that that feels like is just so overwhelming. Um, but the truth of the matter is the studies are in. We know that it is not a one-size-fits-all. But for most three-year-olds who've recently been diagnosed, the, the prescription would be 40 hours a week. Um, and, I mean, I guess there are some exceptions. But for the average three-year-old who's just been diagnosed 40, 40 hours is, is pretty much the prescriptions. That's what the, the studies have shown, but no one can afford that. Oprah can't afford that. And so that's why we fought so hard for insurance funding. And now the irony that insurance funding is trying to normalize that nine hours a week is enough makes me go a little bonkers. Let's get to the no, question. We, 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 I was expecting it all along. It's just taken eight years to get here. Six to eight years. Well, you're a visionary then because I have. No, I just, I'm just a lawyer and I've dealt with insurance companies for my entire legal career. That's all. I thought that insurance, having insurance was going to be the promised land. But, you know, they're, they're always remind me that when people got to the promised land, there were no curtains, there were no buildings. You still have to do the hard work. And I, I guess what I wanted, Bonnie, was for people to not have to work so hard to get funding. And in some respects, if people are in the know, they don't have to work as hard for funding, but you have to work hard to be in the know. And that's why we're here at the well, end of the day. Let's talk for a second about what it was like in the old days. Oof, in terms of yeah. how hard you had to work to get funding, you had to bring a case against your school district and, and try to argue that their offer wasn't appropriate and it was very hard and you had to go to hearing often and people took out second mortgages on their house to pay for ADA. Yeah. It was awful. It was yeah. awful. So, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, at least now if you have an insurance company in there jerking you around, you have a basic entitlement. And I think if you are serious about getting ABA and your insurance company is giving you a problem, there are insurance professionals who will help you to get those hours. So, you know, uh, it's, e it's easier now. What's hard now is the proliferation of companies so that it's impossible to be knowledgeable in all of them. And then the other um, issue is really, you know, uh, the nomenclature. Like I've had clients say to me, what's so great about ABA? And then when I asked them what they were doing, they were basically somebody who's coming in a couple times a week and giving them parent training. Right. So right. People, people need to know what they're fighting for. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, and it's something we're always trying to do here. I don't, I don't know why it's so hard, but, um, but yes. Um, absolutely. We got a lot of people shedding a lot of love. Um, people saying we used to pay a hundred dollars an hour. Yeah. Um, out of pocket, which, you know, it's, it's crazy. And think about, so you need 40 hours of that a week. Uh, okay. So that's Let's $2, get to the dollars a year. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. So okay. let's, but that's just for the therapy, not everything else. Let's get to this question that someone wrote in. Uh, okay, uh, they write. They wrote in a bunch of questions and I farmed them out to different people. The, but the part that was for you, Bonnie, 
She's got a three-year-old. Uh, well, she's turning three next year in April. So two and a half right now. They're in Los Angeles. I'm so afraid about her future with this COVID that I'm at a loss. Do I have options for her? Do we need to be in the school to get any services? I have private insurance. I don't know if this helps. Does she need to be in school? I would rather focus on ABA and other surface service services, excuse me, uh, than school. And I'm so excited to have you answer this question, Bonnie. Okay. Well, one of my favorite things would be to have periodically parents come in who had either a two-year-old that was about to turn three or a three-year-old. And the reason I was excited about it was that I felt like I was one of the first people that was going to sit with them and I could make sure that they got the information that was important. So uh, first of all, you know, I would tell people that, that having a diagnosis of autism is really like having a childhood cancer and you have to intervene aggressively and you have to do whatever is necessary, even if it's, you know, painful or hard because you don't get a second, you don't get a do over. Um, also, I would say that in California, compulsory education starts at age six. So you can absolutely keep the two-year-old out of school and do ABA. And the, and the great news about having insurance coverage is you can do it, you know, um, full time and they can they can pay for it and in you know it, it would vary from child to child but uh like with my son there was a six month period of initial skill building before he was ready to go into a school setting and he didn't start his treatment before so at four and a half he went into a private preschool with a full-time shadow and he he stayed there for a year and a half and he went to kindergarten a year late if i had a three-year-old with autism I would so not involve myself in the fight with the public school district. The yeah. reason why is because the public school district is going to offer you, if you're like an LUSD, they're either going to offer you a Head Start program, which maybe would be all right, or they're going to offer you a special day class. We know from the research that if your child is high functioning enough to benefit, your child should be in a general ed preschool. And, and in Los Angeles, through COVID, you know, we had and we still have a list of preschools that would take a child with a shadow and we would put them there. Now, why is that different from using a public program? Because in many public school districts, the focus is to defeat the parent so that the parent can't make the case that the district should pick up the ABA therapy when the time comes. And so what should happen and what can happen in a good um, private pre-K setting is that the people in the who are running the program, the teachers, will collaborate with the parents to get the best um, result for the child. When you are in a public school, more times than not, they are very concerned with making the case that you don't need the aid or their aid is good enough or, um, you know, anything along those lines. And so, you don't need to be fighting two battles when one of the battles you're fighting is autism. And, you know, so put off that public school stuff. Now, oh, shit. Um, sorry. Um, why would you, what would the reason be for asking the school district to offer you FAPE? As far as I'm concerned, the only reason would be to get an offer from them that's going to be a bad offer so that you could sue them for preschool tuition reimbursement and ABA co-pays. So that might be a reason to do it if the ABA co-pays and preschool were cost prohibitive. But I have had dozens of conversations with parents where I've said to them, go do ABA for a year and a half. Don't get bogged down in this other stuff. And the feedback I got after the fact was that was the right message. Yeah. So um, what other questions were contained within her question? Did we answer them all? No, I think that you answered really well. And I, and I got to say that I also agree with you that, um, you know, back in the day when, when we were starting, we did have to go through the school district because we were fighting for funding. Um, because we didn't have insurance. But here in Los Angeles, 
um, there are there are two things that I can three things that I can suppose is that this this family member um, can come to you when it is time to go to school to negotiate what to do, which is great. So that's in your pocket. Um, here in California, we have Medi-Cal. And every single child that's in California, we've, we've been told that parents, every single parent, regardless of your income, should apply for Medi-Cal, that, that you'll get denied on the first go through if your income is too high, and that once you've been denied that, then you apply under disability, but that that will, if, even if you have private insurance, having Medi-Cal is going to be useful and important for you for many reasons down the road. But um, you know, I know that through those things that, th and also there is, a, there's a lot of really good ABA in Los Angeles. Yes, there's a shortage in therapists right now. So that was but my I, question. Yeah, what, what should you do about, what should you do if you don't have the kind of social opportunities that you, you want yeah. through COVID? Um, I hope it's okay if I say this on the air because it's another ABA company and I don't know if CARD's doing the same thing, but Go for CUSP, it. CUSP has, C-U-S-P, has um, been setting up, as I understand it, pods for, for families. So you can have your child, and you don't have to be getting your treatment through them, I think. You can, you can have your child get in a pod with another child and, and, and have some social interaction. And that would be very, very important. I'm really sorry I skipped the second part of the question because um, I have been thinking about how easy it has been for me during COVID because I don't have any children I'm responsible for. But the other day I was with my little grandson and it was raining and he couldn't go outside and you know he was frustrated. And I was like, this is what it's like to be a COVID parent. You know, you're stuck at home and your your kids need stuff that they're not getting. So I, I think this is going to go on for a while, you know, and I, th and, and, and I think there's a vaccine in sight. So I think it's not going to go on indefinitely. But let's just say for the next six months, if you, if you want to have social opportunities for your child, you're probably going to have to creatively, you know, um, create them um, because I don't think there is going to be a lot out there. And, and it is very hard to imagine being a parent of a child with autism in this particular time period, because I think Shannon knows this, I've told her this before, I would have a fit if a therapist canceled for one session. I was just, you know, I was trying to make sure that it all got done. So this is a really, really hard thing for parents whose children have disabilities. And even for parents whose children don't, they're suffering too. Um, but it's the same old, it's the same old, same old. You gotta, you gotta roll up your sleeves and use your smarts and figure out this stuff just the way you figured out how to help your child and get ADA in the first place. Yeah. We have a parent who's writing in from Oregon who said, how would that work with ABA telehealth and withholding kindergarten? Um, I think it, it largely depends on what age, as you mentioned in California, it's six. I don't know what the age is in Oregon that they need to be in school by. Do you? No, but you can look it up. Well, I don't, I'm not a professional, so I don't want to talk about what I, what my gut reaction is to hearing the term ABA telehealth. Yeah. Well, I, I yes, I think, um, the thing about ABA telehealth that they're finding, um, and they're getting ready to publish a bunch of studies about it, but I will tell you, Bonnie, that, and what I've seen anecdotally from the parents that I work with is that if the parent is available and willing to be there and work as the facilitator. So what it is is that the therapist is online in telehealth mm -hmm. and, and saying to the, the parent, okay, now I want you mm -hmm. to do this, um, mm -hmm. that, what, that what happens then, those children, have, they've learned exponentially and so have the parents. If the parent is not able, and let's face it, a lot of people are not able to because of work to sit there and be the facilitator. Um, and some parents are like, I'm just not good at this. And and let's face it, everybody is not good at this. In those instances, I think it's a really uphill climb. Um, but when the, when the parent or someone in the family is able to sit there with them, we're seeing that the kids make 
so much more progress because not only is the kid learning, but the parent is learning too. It's hard though. It's hard. I don't know that I could have done it, Bonnie. I don't know that I could have done it. But for those parents, they're writing and telling us this is life changing, that they're learning more than they were from watching the therapist because they're doing. So um, yes, uh, Hassan, you can ask questions. Absolutely. Bonnie, I've got another mm -hmm. question. Yeah, there's in. a couple up there. Go ahead. Yeah. So in my state, they are extending school break a week due to the pandemic and mandating masks. I'm all for masks, but as a general question, what should I do as an advocate to help them? So um, I'm, I'm assuming that you mean- Well, I don't know if they're in students? California, which it would be helpful if they could tell us if they are. In California, I have some stuff. I thought I shared it on the show, but maybe I just have it and I have to figure out what I did with it there there are there is a base for asking for a mask exemption okay for your child um it might be worth trying to build up your child's distress tolerance and wear the mask a little bit every day before going back to school um to protect the child not not so much other people um yeah so there there are there are exemptions for kids that can't wear masks because of their their disability. Um, somebody else is asking, what about, could, could you skip kindergarten and do ABA in, instead? Um, I would think by kindergarten, you'd want to have some kind of social environment for your child to practice the social skills in. But in California, kindergarten is not mandatory if you are under six. And so, yes, you could stay out. My son went to preschool between five and six. It was a good use of his time. He was behind. He needed the social. Academics were not necessary yet, and he didn't have so much trouble with academics. So really, until six in California, you can um, do whatever you want. After six, if you were to keep going and your insurance company would keep paying, all you have to do is file a private school affidavit, which is a very simple thing to do. In California, if you want to homeschool your child, you go online to the California Department of Ed, you fill in a, an affidavit, it's a two page form, you say you're running a private school in your home and that's it. They don't ask you for anything else. So you don't have to worry about um, getting in trouble with the state if you do that. It's, 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 it's perfectly permissible in theory to homeschool your child indefinitely if that's what you wanted to do when you had ABA to do it. There you go. Uh, the other person uh, said, I'm a self-advocate in West Virginia, the one who wanted to know how can I help with the masks, but I'm an advocate for everyone and want to help as much as possible. And Parker, that's You, so you have to talk to your Department of Health and your, um, your, um, your Department of Education and see what the, what the position is on masks in, in your state. I, I just have information about California. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the, the clear, um, visors. Um, and there are some that, that are like eyeglasses. I mean, they're all a little bit different and we've tried a bunch of them. Um, but I, I the thing that's so frustrating for me about masks, um, is that, you know, for the kiddos that are learning to speak, they're not seeing the, the movement of the mouth, which is part of what we want them to see. I, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, and I, I'm a big believer in masks for health, but uh, when we're trying to learn, I love for them to be able to see as well as hear the person. So, um, but there are a lot of different interesting um, visors that are out there that people are utilizing. I, interestingly enough, the entertainment industry is really um, forging new inroads because a lot of people are back in production and on sets and they're seeing what works and what doesn't work. And I'm fascinated whenever I have an opportunity to see the camera people and what they're wearing on the set. Cause every, you know, they're huge insurance policies and everybody's being very careful on the set because they don't want to have a COVID outbreak. And I'm, I'm seeing a lot of interesting paraphernalia um, that they're wearing. And, and then because of the nature of what they're doing, a lot of it is clear which is fascinating. I'm even seeing masks that have a panel in them that's clear. Yeah, clear panel. Um, yeah. Well, those of us that have glasses have particular problems. But anyway, yeah. I, I have two quick things if we have time. Yes, yes. we've got um, 
four minutes, Bonnie. Okay, on enough? different on different topics. Um, this is from Special Ed Connection again. I just thought it was interesting. It's a topic that comes up. Gifted versus twice exceptional. What's the difference? Just because a student has an IEP for gifted education doesn't mean she's twice exceptional. The phrase twice exceptional student, sometimes abbreviated as 2E student, refers to an academically gifted student with a disability. This me means that the student meets both of the following criteria. Now, here's where it gets interesting. In some states, we have IEPs for giftedness. Giftedness is a child that has an IQ that's a, typically two standard deviations above 100, which is average. Um, and uh, that can mean you have an IQ score of at least 130. California does not have uh, IEPs for giftedness, but apparently Florida does. So uh, if you have a giftedness designation, but you also qualify under the IDEA, um, under one of the 13 disabilities, then you also will be a student with a disability. And what I can tell you is I'm seeing a lot of kids coming through the system. Some of them have specific learning disability, but are very bright. Some of them have autism, but have very high IQs. And public school gets stuck on the ability. And they think that because of the ability, there's no need on their part to deal with the disability. They don't think it's real and they don't think it has an educational impact. So 2E in California is not a recognized special education classification, but it is a real thing. And if you have a child with autism with a very high IQ, the question, the, the, the questions are difficult. Some of these kids have real problems learning how to read with comprehension. A lot of these children need specialized academics because they get bored so easily. But at the same time, they may be very, very delayed socially. So you do have to teach to the weaknesses as well as the strengths. Um, so that's just a little clarification about what people mean when they say twice exceptional. Uh-oh, what happened to your sound? I'm muted, it was me. Okay. Okay. I said I appreciate that so much because uh, we hear that term a lot, but to hear it defined in that way, uh, really important. We are, are just about out of time and I wanna make sure we have enough time for you to talk about Tolner Law Offices and how people can connect to you and in which states um, they should be connecting to you. You mean I can't do my last topic that'll take you, 60 seconds? It, 60 seconds, go for it. Okay, it's, it's not political. It's what Biden's campaign has said about education. He claims his, cam his, his, he claims his administration will increase IDEA funding, quote, to provide 40% of the extra cost of special education within 10 years. He claims that he's gonna raise funds to increase teacher salaries. He says that he's against for-profit and low-performing charter schools, but he supports school choice for magnet schools and high-performing charters. Um, he said he will help school districts create opportunities for teachers to lead beyond the classroom. Teachers will be able to serve as mentors and coaches to other teachers and as leaders of professional learning communities and will be compensated for the additional work they take on. He said he's against arming teachers in the classroom. He will champion, champion legislation to ban assault weapons. Um, he said he will also invest in supports to address trauma in the wake of school violence. And he said he would increase funding and resources for school-based mental health professionals with the goal of doubling in size the available school-based mental health support. So that was brought to you by Toner Law Offices. If you want to talk to us, you can um, go to our website and fill in the forms. And if you're in California, Arizona, or Nevada, you can um, follow up and have a conversation with us. If you're in one of the other uh, states, you should go to COPA, C-O-P-A-A dot net. Thank you for posting that. And they have an attorney directory and you can talk to some attorneys in your state and get some advice and hopefully some help. So, Bonnie, thank you so much and a very happy belated birthday to you. I hope you have a great week and a great year. We're great, very grateful for you. 
Uh, we'll see you back here next week. Tomorrow, we're back with a best of Temple Grandin episode. Ooh. So look forward to having you then. And then on Wednesday, Dr. Grampy Shea is here. On Thursday, we're just bringing out the recipes for all of you on special diets for Thanksgiving. And on Friday, we got Vince Redmond, licensed marriage and family therapist. So it's a big week here at Autism Live. We're getting wow. ready to put out our toy guide. I feel like uh, I should just take a week off from work and watch the show. <laughs> well, next week when everybody's off, we're planning on doing a marathon of our best of 2019 all throughout the Thanksgiving weekend. So oh. no one no one will be without their Autism Live. Even You're the woman that thinks of everything, Shannon. Thank you so no, much. It's, it's all Traven. I, it just looks like it's me. It's all Traven. Thank Thank you, everybody. Have a great Bye, day. Uh, give, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.